And now, coming to you live. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody, let's sing along. Hi there. My name is Roland Sandberg, and I tune in all the way here in Finland, Europe. Lots of greetings from Finland. Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Talking Tunes. I'm your announcer, Kitty Litter. Now it's time to talk to the loon tunes of Talking Tunes. Here they are, the Talking Tunes crew. 91X, FAMA, Baja California, Mexico. Welcome to Talking Tunes 2020. Time now for Talkin' Tunes on 100.9 FM. Talkin' Tunes, a weekly roundtable discussion on music, radio, entertainment, television, nothing too serious, just light and lively chatter with your host, Oscar Osbo. All right, Talkin' Tunes, and we're here with Mr. What is your name again? Don Anderson. <laughs> I think who, so. Who was that guy? I just stopped by to see if you have any toilet paper this morning. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Do you, do you know how many trees it takes to provide toilet paper for the entire world for one day? Well, no. Go ahead. 27,000. I kind of like this, this little birch you got out here. Can I take that with you? Yeah, right. Cut it. You know, I have some, I have some trees I, I cut down back there. You could probably cut them into slivers okay. and you can use right. it as toilet paper. Well, that, that sounds about where I am these days. <laughs> Might be a little rough, but... <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah, it'll be definitely roughing it, that's for sure. Yeah, right. Well, you know, the problem is is that you and I are both in that category of being over the age, or I like I I have congestive heart failure, so that, you know, puts me in that risk factor. You are over I have so many maladies over I the hill. Hey, over the over the <laughs> as long as it's a straight plane, I'm okay. You know, I just yeah. uh, yeah, that's what happens. You know, I've had allergies and asthma all my life, but when you get older, they get a little bit worse, yeah. you know, and you just got to kind of live with it. So all of us, all of us older people are a little, little concerned these days, but uh, we're not going to let it get us down. It too shall pass. That's right. Yep. So Don Anderson, if, if, if anybody doesn't know by the, by now, it's one of the biggest names in radio ever in Mesquite that history. Is, that is so overblown. I mean, <laughs> you know, Oscar, I was thinking about that. I was only on the air in Muskegon for about, uh, let's see, 60 to 67 or thereabouts. So that's that was my, my so, tenure as far as a regular afternoon slot or any slot. So what, five years? Um, no, about seven. We said 62 to 67. That 60, would be- 62. Oh, two. See, one 67. of the things that goes quickly is <laughs> <laughs> and, and also the tongue doesn't work, so I don't enunciate the way yeah, I, I gotcha. should. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. 60 to 67, roughly that. Now, that was strictly a true? That was a true. Okay. So there wasn't yeah. any other Muskegon station? No. Uh, well, no, that wasn't. Uh, see, you got me all messed up now. That was, si- it was 60. It's not hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a long time ago, Mike. How yeah. many years was I married? I can't even remember that. First, in I was at sixty. I was one. So yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was uh, true. It was a relatively short stint. Afternoon drive was from sixty three until sixty seven. Prior to that, I wrote commercials and did fill in. And before that, I was at MUS CBQ, which is LRC. The tower is still outside uh, the door. I think. Okay, now MUS. That was before the country and everything else came about. It was. I started there in the fall of sixty two. Okay. How deep do we want to get into? I mean, this <laughs> as deep as you'd like, you know. We got it's all kinds deep. of time. I, I need can't those, those nobody boots. wants to, nobody wants to come to the nobody studio. Nobody wants to come and, into the studio. You know, so, I mean, um, I think I started it was the fall of '62, and a month or two later, I had the privilege and honor and distinction of being the first person to talk on WMUS FM. No one knows that because no one was listening. Right, right. Um, but yeah, that was we signed that on, and yeah, FM and, was uh, kind of a strange thing it, back then. It was. It was very strange. Yeah. But I stayed there for oh about six months, and then an opening came at True to write copy. A fellow by the name of Chuck Rich, who ended up leaving True to form his own station, ZND in Zealand. I think were the calls. Okay. It's that station when you go down the expressway and turn to go south toward the St. Joe area. Uh, the one that sits back there, that tower, that was his. I don't know, know if he still has that or not. Okay. Chuck Rich, real character. Just don't a know. good guy. Um, I wrote copy for a year, and then Ron Tyndall left true. Now, just, to, just out of curiosity, backing up as far as writing copy, how did you get that de- job? Did you, were you a, a writer for a paper or something? I, or? You know, you want to do this thing and understand for 
uh, the Muskegon Heritage Association. Yeah. That's going to have to be a much longer show to get into all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, there's so many. I, I don't know how, you know, I could talk for probably three hours, but my voice would go. Yeah. Um, I got into the copywriting because I had been working at True part-time in high school. Oh, okay. And I had worked at True off and on filling in uh, for probably a year or two. I'd go back to True, and then I'd go to a station, then I'd go back to True. and um, But an opening came up, and they said, hey, would you like uh, to come and write copy? I said, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike Boonstra and Charlie Boonstra weren't too happy with me. Bunker Rogoski, I think, threw me out the door when I told <laughs> them. I No, I'm kidding. Uh, I told them I was leaving to go to True. His words were, we're a family here. I said, yeah, but you got coal on your hands. I don't know. <laughs> No, they were they were great people. They really were. Um, but I went to True. That's what I always love about <laughs> you, man. You're direct and honest. That's what I love about you. Uh, that's you what my wife says. You speak the truth. You speak um, the truth. I wrote copy for a year and then did part-time as well. One of the neatest part-time gigs I ever did was substituting a GRD, our sister station. WTRU was owned by regional broadcasters. Okay. And WGRD was our sister station in Grand Rapids. And I think it was the summer of 62, that sounds about right, that if somebody wants to fact check this, really, I mean, a lot of it must be fake news because I can't remember what's yeah. <laughs> where it was yesterday morning, yeah. except looking for toilet paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but I got to uh, fill in for uh, the jocks over at GRD. That was Bill Merchant in the morning. Bob Yashu Whitcomb in the uh, midday, and Skip Bell afternoon. Nope. And that was it because GRD was a daytimer. He used that name on the radio? Who? Yashu. Yashu. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yashu was the polka king of Grand Rapids. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was on. And then I would engineer. In fact, I got a picture somewhere in the back of my head engineering for uh, Bob on his polka show. Uh, up at the White House on the Hill, 50, whatever it was on Lafayette. Oh, oh there's something to get up for right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but um, I filled in for the GRD jocks that summer, um, came back, worked at McDonald's from whatever time I could get back, usually about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, McDonald's on Sherman. And then I would leave early at 5.30 to go out to True to substitute for Jack Leroy, Jack Majeski, who had to make... They have to make sure that the whole uh, AM array is within bounds. Now, and Jack so, Majeski was on the air. For oh a yeah, while? Jack oh, okay. Leroy. Yeah, you didn't know that? No, mm, no sure. I didn't. Jack's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen him for a number of years, but I'm looking forward to catching up with him soon. Yeah. Mike Majeski, of course, is one of the premier engineers right. in this whole part of the state. And, and Mike, and, I, Mike, I know well. <laughs> Mike, yeah. Jack's son. Jack was Jack Leroy, a very good announcer, but the reason that he was on True and the reason he got the job was because he was a first phone, had a first-class ticket. And True being directional had to have somebody on duty all times uh, when they were in the directional array. Uh, so anyway, I did, that was a wild summer. And then middays I would do McDonald's, and then I came back and, and sat in for Jack until midnight and then started the whole thing over again about 4 o'clock in the morning, driving to Grand Rapids for Bill or middays and so forth uh, uh, for the jocks over there. That was that was fun. Yeah. Now, what, what is this thing you used to do as far as the, the dance party that you used to, used to? Oh, the Grand Haven Beach Bash. Beach Bash, okay. Skip Knight and I started the Beach Bash in the uh, – it was concurrent with me going full-time or afternoon drive. I had been full-time uh, writing copy. But um, – Skip set up an arrangement with the Grand Haven Roller Rink where the proceeds from running the dances would go a third to the roller rink, a third to the station, and then Skip and I would split the other third. That was a sixth apiece, I think. <laughs> paid for, paid for our, the down payment on our house in uh, Grand Haven years wow. later. I do remember that. Wow. Um, it was a very, very successful venture. We had we didn't have the ventures, but we had just about everybody else. We had you know the big acts out of Detroit. We would run on Wednesday and Saturday nights in the summer, and then just Saturday nights in the uh, winter time. Um, but we had everybody. The Detroit groups were clamoring to come over and do the bash because they got all the exposure of GRD and Grand Rapids. We would run spots concurrent with uh, the spots that ran on True, and 
they were they would call us. I did the booking, and they would call me and say, "Hey, we got this act, we got this," and that's how we got a lot of our acts. Acts like SRO. I don't know if you ever heard of it. No, the Detroit group. Did you ever hear of Mitch Ryder? Oh yeah, <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> yeah, I've ta- I actually talked to Mitch at one I time. I think I remember yeah. you mentioning it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had Mitch Ryder. Uh, we had Alice Cooper when he was just starting out. Wow. Yeah. Wild, wild show. I mean, he was. It was kind of neat. I think back. I didn't realize at the time. I thought this guy is going nowhere. He'd do these crazy <laughs> things on stage, and I thought this is a flash in the pan for sure. Yeah. And look what he uh, ends up doing. But Still he was doing it at seventy years old. Oh yeah. my word! He was just just nuts. We had this tiny little stage. Couldn't have been more than fifteen twenty feet wide, and you know probably that deep. Um, that these acts would go up on, and, and I was afraid that he was going to fall off uh, any corner any time. <laughs> but we had the big acts of, uh, of the day, Tommy James, Paul and Paula, Dick and Dee Dee. Uh, all these acts would come in. Some of them brought their own bands, had their, their own band. Others, we'd have to go out and get a house band. And some of them would sing uh, along with the record. They would just lip sync it. Right. There was a fella on the air by the name of Bob Klein. He did Middays at True when I was doing Afternoon Drive. Bob and I uh, arranged this routine for Sonny and Cher's You Got Me, Babe, <laughs> where I played the part of Sonny. Bob was a much heftier guy than Skinny Mini Me. Uh, Handy Andy, the Slim Slender one, is one of the things I used down the air. Of course, nobody could see me because, as you know, ugly or, or uh, guys that don't look very good get on the radio because yeah, they don't yeah, want to yeah, be yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he was he played the part of Cher and I was Sonny. I had on Sonny's wild sport coat and he had on the dress and the whole thing. We got to the end of the record. You know where the the pause is where it says you got me babe yeah. and then there's a pause and yeah. then the instrumental comes back in. Bum 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 bum. Well, Skip Knight was running the record player. He didn't realize there was a pause there. So when the pause came, we're going into the latter part of our routine and he picks the needle off the record. <laughs> <laughs> we said Put it back on. Put it back. So he puts it back on. And the last part of it was Bob picked me up in his arms and we sang the last chorus or lip synced the last chorus. And then he let me down and we both took a bow. And on his bloomers that he wore, he flipped his dress up and my wife had embroidered on there, applause, please. Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah, stupid little things like that. But the, the, Kids that we, we had at the dance just loved that stuff. It was yeah. just, and we'd do a, whatever we thought of something stupid like that. You know, we'd come come and do it. Now, a lot of the announcers that uh, of today, uh, yesterday also were part of your program, too. Like, I remember Tim, it wasn't Tim Ackerhoff part of that, too? or I gave Tim his first radio gig, I think, although I watched uh, the tape, that uh, the interview that you did, and I might okay. be wrong in that. But we had a program on Saturday. It's, it was the first time I got a thing on True okay. um, called Class Break. Okay. Uh, so Mar- this is totally different then. Yeah, totally okay. different. Um, totally different than what? Well, totally different than the, the beach party. Oh, yeah. We're talking. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah I, okay. I'm slipping. You asked about Tim Ackerman. I'm sorry. So I, didn't mean to, I, didn't, I didn't mean to confuse <laughs> you that badly. Well, it doesn't take much these days, believe <laughs> no. me. Um, I did class break with uh, a gal by the name of Marquita Ecker. Marquita went to Muskegon Heights. I went to Muskegon, but she uh, had this show on, and I don't remember who she was doing it with before me, but she called up and she said, I need somebody to do a class break with. And she knew that I was hanging around true and, you know, becoming yeah. a pest, generally speaking. And she said, would you want to do it? I said, sure. So we Saturday mornings, we would read class news from the various high schools. Okay. Um, when I, I had been long gone from class break, but because I had gone full time in the radio, um, we needed somebody at True to do the show. Tim had been hanging around, bugging the daylights out of everybody. So I said, "Look, I'm just kidding." I said, <laughs> "No, you're not." <laughs> I said, "Tim, we've got this this show on Saturday mornings." And I told him, what. "He said, oh, I know. I listen to it all the time." I said, "How would you like to be the guy, the male portion of the two uh, person team?" He said, "Sure, I'd love to." At that time, we renamed it, if you remember doing the interview that uh, I watched when you and Tim were talking, we called it Class Break A Go-Go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because by then, A Go-Go, you know, the Go-Go stuff had come into to being, and we renamed it. But So Tim was on that, and uh, I think that's one of the, could be one of the first things that he did in radio. So yeah. anyway, yeah. lots of people through the years, uh, great people. Anyway, now as far as true true goes, now did uh, was that Fred Tascone that hired you over there, or was that? 
well, let's see. I was hired first by Skip Knight. Skip was the program director. Okay. And I was at MUS. I had done class break and got a call, and Skip said, we've got um, this opening for a copywriter. He said, Fred would like to talk to you. So I came in and uh, talked to Fred, and he hired me. Fred was the, he was the, probably, I know you always ask people who, who was important in somebody's career. Fred right. was that guy for me. Okay. Uh, he hired me at True. He hired me at GRD. He never fired me, which was kind of nice. <laughs> but uh, I, I owe so much to Fred Tascone, and so do many, many people right. uh, in the area. Uh, he probably fired a few people too, but uh, I'm sure <laughs> you. <laughs> oh yeah, twice. <laughs> well, that's the nature of the business. Uh, <laughs> things happen. In fact, we had a WGRD reunion back in 2010 at the uh, Hilton over in Grand Rapids, and somebody stood up and said, "Who all has been fired in this room?" I don't think there was a single person in radio, and they were all in radio except for the wives. Uh, who hadn't been fired. Right. We yeah. all stood up and said, yeah, me, me, me. Yeah. I got fired from CBQ when it was uh, CBQ before LRC. Now, was this firing, though, because of programming changes? Or oh, no. Not did... mine. No. Oh. <laughs> so it wasn't me. It was a program change is what they did. No, no. I There were various reasons. I I clashed with the owner of the, yeah. the son's owner. Yeah, I've never clashed CBQ. with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> well, he was always late for his shift at CBQ, the the Whitehall station, and I got tired of it. So one day, I waited for his car to drive in the country road that the station was located on, which is right out somewhere close to here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh, I waited for for his car that I could see, you know, hundreds of yards down. Right. And I had a record on the turntable, so I got in my car, car, drove out, rolled down the window, and said, "Hey." Your record's about to end. You're late. Goodbye. That didn't go over very well. <laughs> so, but I was, what, 18, 19 years old at the time. Now, is this 95.3, the frequency that you were at? Or no, no, this? no. This is uh, 1490. Oh, 1490. 14, okay, no, right. no, no. This is way before. Okay. All right. Uh, this is 1490 this WCBQ. Is okay. This is I'm AM, sorry. right. I forgot. We used to, uh, Sunday afternoons, I ran all. I, I would go to work at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. It was a day timer. Right. And sign it off, sign it on, sign it off. The afternoon, we had nothing but church services. Oh, okay. So I would bring my twenty two rifle and a bunch of cans, and the railroad tracks that ran behind the station, I would use as a backdrop, right. as, as something to stop the shells, and I would shoot tin cans all afternoon listening for the tape to end. You know, mm -hmm. stupid things like that. Okay. Now, 1490, uh, isn't that that one that's right next door to me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the railroad track used to be there. Now it's a, yeah, it's gone. Now it's a just, bike trail. Just a berm. <laughs> in fact, first time I was out here, your place, I went through the old station, and I still saw some of the things we wrote on the wall in the sales really? office. Yeah, good things about, you know, there's a, here's a, a client to see, or here's a package we want to sell or something. Yeah, see, that was the first radio station I ever worked at. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was 1490, mm -hmm. but it was WPBK then. And um, that building, at that equipment, because that was the first job I had as far as in radio, because I worked... Um, I, I got the job to fix cart machines, which were 110 years old at that time when I went in there to do them. I mean, you remember the old cart machines. I mean, the really old cart machines with the, the big metal handle you pulled back when you put the cart in. I remember them, but when I worked at CBQ, this was before cart machines. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> we had no, t I don't think we had any What you do, burn commercials on record or what? <laughs> no, we read them all live. No, we oh, okay, no, I, take, right. I, I'm take that, I take that back because I remember... Recording a commercial, and at this point, I'm at community college, and I hadn't really decided this was going to be what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Right. And I remember recording a commercial. It had a, a music bed. It had an open and a close, and I had to put the insert in. And I remember being so excited going home and telling my folks, I've just decided what I want to do. Yeah. I think they threw me out of the house at that point and said, you know, <laughs> you're on your own, kid. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, um, and we had some kind of a, maybe it was a cart machine, an early cart machine. I don't remember that. They were pretty old anyway. I remember, well, I remember the turntables <laughs> were so old that, you know, you, with turntables, you keep bar buying a new cartridge or a new, uh, new needle for them, and you can keep going with those. But those were very old, too. They, were, they weighed like, I don't know, 150 pounds oh, yeah. a piece, you know. Great boat anchors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, you know, the, the magnetic turntables, they were perfect for 
cueing records and all that good stuff. So, now were you a were you a pro at that as far as cueing records and uh, now did you program your own format for WTRU, or was that program for you? Uh, no, we did our own format. Okay, you know, it was all done in house. Um, as far as cueing a record, the person that taught me how to cue records was Ray Hosier, okay. who a lot of people will remember either from radio or from television because he did a lot of television for Channel 13. I used yeah, I to substitute for him. Right. Uh, he did the drop-ins or the, the cut-ins from Muskegon, from Muskegon News, from Channel 13, from the old Occidental Hotel. And I did a couple of those, uh, which I, I still regret to this day because my wife reminds me about it once in a while and said, you, you need to stick to radio. It was, <laughs> it was pretty bad, and I won't go into any more detail on that. Um, but Ray taught me how he did a Sunday morning show on True called The Sound of Music where they would play these long, you know, beautiful music LPs, this type yeah. of thing. But he taught me how to cue a record, taught me how to open the mic switch, taught me some production techniques, and I was off and running. So he's the one that kind of taught you, and it, because there's a lot of people that mentioned, like Bob Moore and Tim Akterhoff, both mentioned that you were the one that kind of taught them how to how to do the editing and, and, and working with a lot yep. of the different things. Ray was the one that, uh, he was... Uh, next to Fred Tascone was probably as instrumental as I can remember in in uh, getting me into radio and fostering that uh, that uh, that lo love of the business as it yeah, became. Yeah, yeah. Mine was in KBZ. I think his name was Dave Robinson. I think it was Robinson. I can't I can't remember anymore. I'm I'm getting at that point too where I can't remember names. Uh, Matt Shepard was one of our afternoon news anchors at our station in South Haven. Matt came to us from Central Michigan University. Um, and then was hired by, I'm trying to remember if it was JR, I don't think it was JR, one of the Detroit stations hired him, and he ended up going to into television with Fox. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat to see these people that, that, you know, you worked with you, that you maybe hired, that maybe you had, you know, you taught them how to cue a record or something, and uh, then they go on to much bigger and better things than you ever thought possible. But right. that's, that's, there's a lot of... Uh, enjoyment in seeing that. I watch Matt every time and think about uh, the days when he worked with us. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, people like, um, you wouldn't recognize the name from listening to Grand Rapids Radio, China Smith. China Smith was Wayne Thomas doing Afternoon Drive at WGRD in probably 67, 68 when I was program director over there. And he went on to KHJ in Los Angeles, KCWQ, or some some stations, several stations out in the LA area. Uh, San Diego. He went to. Uh, he came back at one point in his career and was nighttime jock from like six to midnight on WODJ out of Grand Rapids. Okay, I'd call him up. We would talk and uh, uh, remember the old times at GRD and a heck of a talent, Thomas Rohrbacher. He wouldn't mind me giving his real name, I'm sure. He passed down a number of years ago. Well, what is he going to say if he passed down a number of years ago? I mean, come on. <laughs> That's what I said. He wouldn't yeah, mind. he wouldn't mind. Yeah, okay. Now, <laughs> now as far as tr true goes, what, what was your your uh, your time slot? I mean, were you mornings? Were you nights? No, no, or? afternoon drive. Afternoon, afternoon drive. Afternoon drive, yeah. Okay. Two to six. Okay. Now, when you went from true, how did you go? What did you, what did you go next uh, to Grand Rapids? Well... I, I left, there came a time when I knew I couldn't go into that tiny little control booth anymore. I, I just, I had decided that I didn't want to continue in announcing. Okay. Because I was married at the time, we had our first child, and even though I'd had an opportunity to go to WKMI in Kalamazoo, uh, and about a month later, WOKY Walkie in Milwaukee called and said, we got this slot open for you. I said, oh my walkie wow <laughs> about three years earlier i would have probably jumped at it but yeah. i had this realization that i didn't want to go chasing that golden microphone all over the country as so many people do and and do very well doing it, it just wasn't me i i was more of a homebody i guess i wanted to put down roots uh so i decided that it wasn't for me to stay on the air fred came and said uh one day I need a program director in Grand Rapids. He was general manager of TRU as well as GRD. And uh, I said, yeah, fine, I'd love to do it. So we bought a house in Grand Haven as opposed to the house we were renting in Muskegon. We've been married, I think, maybe two years. And 
moved to Grand Haven because he said, I'm still going to need a lot of things out of you here in, in Muskegon. I still want you to do some programming here, do some voices, whatever it may have been, right. uh, music selection, that type of thing. Um, so we moved to Grand Haven, long story short, because it was in between. You know, I could go down to, what is that, Lake Michigan Drive, was about 10 minutes from the house, and beat it into Grand Rapids. Um, I was at GRD for two years, uh, program director. And at that point, I saw that, you know what, the real money in the business, as far as I could see, was not necessarily on the air, unless you were somebody that went on to a Los Angeles or a Chicago. That just wasn't me. Number one, I didn't have the confidence that I could do it. Number two, I didn't want to do it. And as I say, I saw that sales and uh, administration was probably where the, the real money in the business was. So I went to Fred one day and said, you know, if anything ever opens up over at True, I'm doing program director in uh, Grand Rapids, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'd like to take a shot at that. He came to me one day and said, uh, Tom Shine, who was a sales rep, uh, at True, and I could talk about Tom, Tom for probably 15 minutes. Uh, he's pretty well known in the Grand Haven, uh, Muskegon area. Tom was transferred to WOLF in Syracuse, New York as general manager, so that opened up a sales spot in Muskegon. And I jumped. I said, I want to do sales. You know, besides not wanting to necessarily be on the air anymore and travel all over changing stations and so forth, one of the underlying reasons that I wanted to go into sales was I got to wear a suit and tie. Every really? Day. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine anything so no. dumb? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I remember walking out of the house and, man, I, this is great. <laughs> that lasted probably four or five weeks. Mm, <laughs> and then I said, what have I done? But I enjoyed it. I, was, I sold in the uh, Muskegon area, Muskegon and Grand Haven, Whitehall, for two years. And then here comes Fred again. He calls one Saturday morning. I'll never forget. Arlene and I are in our house in Grand Haven. Fred calls and said, uh, I've got something I want to talk to you about. What's the story? He said, I would like you to go uh, to Grand Rapids as general manager of WGRD. You know, what? Yeah. I mean, what? GRD had just become um, a full-time FMAM uh, operation hmm, probably three or four months prior to this. This was April of uh, 71. Okay. And I said, let me get back to you. We talked it over, and Arlene said, you know, whatever. I'm in it for the long haul. I called Fred up, and I said, uh, yeah, I want to do it. So um, April, latter part of April, uh, I picked up, went to GRD in Grand Rapids, and was general manager. And it was, the, it was one of the best decades of my life because I, I was there from 71 until uh, 81. One of the things in the regional group that they – uh, adhered to as far as promotion of people. If you wanted to manage a station, they looked for people who had been announcers. Mm -hmm. And then they looked for people who had been announcers and salesmen, sales reps. Right. Um, because we understood, and I say we because I happen to come out of that, that school of thought, we understood what it takes to be on the air. We understood the... Uh, the problems that salespeople had when they're out selling, right? And we could take and run the station based on those two facets. I mean, besides engineering, there's not a whole lot, le uh, not a whole lot else. It's what time is it? I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> is it nap time? <laughs> it must be nap time. <laughs> um, there's there are so many things that happen to announcers, so many things that happen to sales reps. That somebody coming out of, let's say, bookkeeping or accounting and put into a, a GM spot, it's done a lot now. It's done way too much as far as I'm concerned because they don't understand the, the trials and tribulations of the people who are coming up through the ranks and who are actually running the station, right. running the programming. They, they don't understand or they, they wouldn't have no comprehension that the announcers at WGRD-FM, when we made the switch from the... 12 by 60 mobile home where the where the the offices were located at Plymouth and Leonard in Grand Rapids when we made the switch from the transmitter building that was next door to the uh, the, the mobile home this is how the station ran when I arrived in 1971 okay. bookkeeping sales run out of the mobile home the announcers were out in the transmitter shack by shack I'm talking about open ceilings Wow, really? Uh, uh, it was so bad that 
there was a light, light bulb that literally hung down to light up their, their cards in front of them, <laughs> their promos, wow. their liners. And the biggest thing is the first guy that was going to read a liner and went, and, you know, to get a breath of air, swallowed a bug. <laughs> And had to be taken off. You know, somebody had to come in the rest of the night because the poor guy couldn't talk. It was that bad. <laughs> Must it have was, been a big bug. <laughs> it was a pretty good-sized bug, I guess. I, guess, I can't remember yeah. who it was. There was another thing. They put a sign on the bathroom in this transmitter shack where this this 50,000-watt station was trying to become well-known in Grand Rapids. They put a sign on the bathroom. It said, please don't flush while the announcer is talking. <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody did it on purpose. Yeah. The guy would be doing a WGRD, first in Grand Rat. You know, he'd be doing his liner, and they <laughs> <laughs> just to see if they could rattle him. Yeah. You know, it's just like lighting the news copy of uh, the newsman uh, when he's trying to do the news story. Well, you were talking about Majeski earlier. Mike Majeski, he used to do when I worked at Rock 95, which is a station <clears throat> here in, in Whitehall area. And anyway, he used to do that all the time. He, he When he'd engineer, I did the overnights. When he'd engineer, he'd always come in on the overnights to do his work. Because nobody, he's, you know, according to him, nobody listens in the overnights. So anyway, he uh, come in and he would do, do stuff like that and, and just try to do whatever he could to possibly make me, you know, screw up. And I was brand new. Mm -hmm. So I thought, man, this is just horrible. Why would you do this to this guy that's just trying to be on the radio yep. and... Yep. You know, now it's like I do it myself. You know, it's a lot of fun to, to try to rattle somebody. WGRD FM came into being, it was really a religious experience. And I don't say, I say that somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek, but because of the fact that Fred Tascone was a Roman and is a Roman, do you know Fred is 92? Yeah. 92 years old, still going strong. In 2020 anyway. Huh? In 2020, so when they watch this 20 years from now, they'll, they'll, they'll <laughs> 20, think, yeah, it's wow, good thing, Fred's but, still up? You know. <laughs> um, being a Roman Catholic, Fred got to know Father Michael Bayan and the people in the Grand Rapids Diocese, Catholic Diocese. The Grand Rapids Catholic Diocese had a radio station, WXTO-FM, that had a transmitter and tower on top of Aquinas College. They got into trouble with financially uh, with the FM station because, as Father Mike would tell us later, we were pretty good at religion, but we don't know a thing about this radio business. You know, it just it wasn't what they wanted to do. And knowing Fred, he said something, and I, I'm speculating, he said, can you help us out? Do you know anybody that would like to have this station? Ah, light bulb must have gone off in Tascone's head because... They worked it out where GRD, where regional broadcasters, I should say, bought uh, the station, Lock, Stock, and Tower. Regional broadcasters bought WXTO-FM. We took and moved the tower. They moved it. I wasn't involved in that at this point. Moved it out to Plymouth and Leonard, where the AM station was located, built a new tower. Because the little old tower on XTO, I don't think you could get it probably uh, outside of the Heritage Hill District uh, in Grand Rapids. So when I say a religious experience, that was the connection. That's the reason that WGRDFM came into being. It was because of Fred's association with uh, Catholic Church. the Catholic Church in Grand Rapids. Yeah. Huh. In 78, 9, 80, I was working with like a $150,000 promotional budget. Yeah. That's a lot of money when you take what would it be today? You know, probably three, four hundred thousand right. for a uh, for a top forty rock and roll radio station. That was a lot. We gave away Corvettes, we gave away trips to every place on the globe. I think um, that was one of the the big features. One of the for the forte of the format, along with the music, was the promotions that we did. And there, there's nothing new in radio. I mean, that was no, a statement yeah, way yeah. back then. Yeah, right. So if somebody in Memphis, Tennessee, or Little Rock, Arkansas, or Nome, Alaska, had a, a, a promotion that really worked we'd hear about it right and other people would hear about it and then you'd refine it yeah, oh, yeah. to your station yeah. well that's you know the, the the one thing too is certain certain stations that are owned you know that own many stations you'll go you know down the state and you'll hear that other station but it sounds just like mm -hmm. the station back mm -hmm. in your hometown mm -hmm. because they pretty much format them the same use the same liner guy, sure. use everything. You, How did you come about buying your own station? What, what, what brought that on? 
that was always my goal. Um, first, my goal was when I was in sales and and uh, pr- and programming was to was to manage my own station. Um, Fred was a great manager, but there were things that he did that I disagreed with, things that I would have done differently had it been you know my decision or my station. Um, the other managers that I worked for, you know, basically by and large did a good job, but I could see I don't care for the way he handled this situation or you know what I'm talking about, just difference in people, I guess. Someday I'm going to manage my own radio station and I'm going to do it the way I want to do it and the way I think it should be done. Same thing applied to someday I'm going to own my own station and I don't answer to anybody. I just do what I want to do. What a fallacy that was. I know, right? (laughs) Oh my word, because you answer to the bank. Everybody, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I mean, you got you got that big banker standing there saying, "Hmm, as long as you're making money and pay your, you know, your mortgage, yeah. uh, you're okay." Um, but that I I got to the point with with regional broadcasters where I was managing GRD, GRD, uh, but I was also in charge of the chain. We had stations in from Titusville, Florida, to Syracuse, New York, to Binghamton, New York, Youngstown, Ohio, Meadville, Pennsylvania, Sharon, Pennsylvania, and I'm sure I'm leaving some out. I would spend a week at GRD. I would spend another week on the road at one of the stations, Hmm. going in and seeing what's going on, you got problems, how's your format, all these different things, uh, getting sales forecasts. The third week, in many months, not every month, but many months, I would spend in D.C. with our FCC attorneys. Because you can imagine the, the, all the stuff that goes on. We want to tweak our power. We want to put our tower up. We want to do this. We want to do that. And then we'd spend so much time on regulations. You can't do that, Anderson, because the FCC will take your license away. You know, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I was constantly gone. You know, my wife will tell you, yeah, I remember those days he was kind of like an absentee father at times. And I got tired of that real quick. I did it for about a year and a half, two years, as I recall. And I finally, at one point, said, um, that's enough. And I'm going to have my own station. And I filed an application for the FM station in South Haven, Michigan, that had never been built. It was a construction permit that had been issued by the FCC, and nobody seemed to pay attention to it for quite some time because mm. South Haven was a tiny little town. Right. Um, but I saw it as a, a mini Traverse City on a much, much smaller level because Traverse City is a fantastic yeah. market, radio market, TV right. market, big market. South Haven was this little miniature of that. They had the lake. Uh, they had a booming retail business, uh, just a great place to live. So we decided to apply for the station. I, I could, Oscar, I could go into, it would take me an hour just to tell you about all the ins and outs, how we actually got this radio station. Uh, but it came down to, we got the construction permit against another guy that had the AM station in South Haven. We got it because... He had an existing station. Back then, you could only own seven radio or television combined stations. Right. You know, you could have three a- uh, AMs and three FMs or a TV and whatever made seven, as I recall back then. And we got the big points because we didn't have any radio station broadcast interest whatsoever. I take that back. I had 5% of WAAL in Binghamton that Regional had given to me as a stock option type bonus situation, but I was 5% owner. I was fired from GRD in January of 1981. Did you know that? No. Oh, okay. Well, when I told you about the people that stood up at our reunion, everybody stood up. I was one of them. Regional found out that I had an application in for the FM station. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell them, of course. And they didn't really care for having, uh, having one of their managers or the guy running the group with his own application in in the in WGRD's ADI or TSA or whatever you want to uh, break it down to, and I knew it was coming. I didn't know when, but I got a a letter in the mail one day. We'd like your resignation. I said, "Okay, here we go," and we just stepped things up a little bit. By we, Arlene and I, uh, decided that okay, we're going to build this station in South Haven. We didn't even have the construction permit at the time. Hmm. But, you know, we knew we had a pretty good chance of getting it. 
uh, January of 81, I left, and Ron White was also let go the same month. Other reasons, a bean counter came in in charge of the chain. Ed Bernstein, the fellow who had run the chain for many, many years, was unceremoniously booted out. I don't know to this day exactly all the reasons, but uh, he was gone. I was let go. Ron White was let go. That was a cost-saving measure, I think, because Ron was yeah. one of the higher-paid people in, in the chain. But anyway, um, we didn't know we were going to get the construction permit. I left GRD in January of uh, 81. Between January of 1981 and October 31st of 1981, the day we signed the new FM on, I had to come up with the money to build the radio station. We had to sell our house north of Grand Rapids that we had bought. We had to get the kids registered in another school. We took them to East Grand Rapids. We got the construction permit after we'd been there 30 days. Now we had to move to South Haven, find a house, we had the construction permit in hand, but we didn't have any land to build a tower. We had nothing. One of the, the best things that, that uh, we did uh, is we bought the existing South Haven AM station. I could tell you stories about that station, but in a nutshell, the call letters were WJOR. The local people referred to it as the worst junk on radio. <laughs> Honest, true story. When we came in, the town of South Haven and all the little towns around were so happy to get a local radio station, it was fairly easy. I mean, it, it really, they welcomed us with open arms. So we bought the AM station. We combined it with the FM. Well, what that did was we didn't have to build studios. Right. We used the AM st uh, station studios, right. which were terrible. <laughs> It was just, I mean, in an old building on Main Street on Phoenix Road in downtown South Haven, but it was just just a crummy building. But it worked. We were able to take their existing production facility, which was all mono. We were able to take their ex existing control room. Short story, my one claim to engineering is this story. We had a, a Spartan, I think it was a Sparta board. I don't know, if there, is there such a thing as a Sparta board? I think... Probably, that's but what I, I remember. I haven't heard of it. But, okay, yeah, well, I think yeah. that's what we had. It was about yay big. It had maybe six or eight slide pots. Yeah. It was all mono. So John Seymour, that's who's another story. John helped us get the station on the air. John's well known in engineering all over the Midwest. Um, terrific guy who you can never find unless it was an emergency. But that's a whole other story. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just engineers sometimes are like that, and I'm sorry, Mike and Jack and, and, and the, the people I know in engineering. So the board is mono. And I looked at Seymour one afternoon. We're trying to figure out what are we going to do for a control board. We didn't have the money to buy it. You know, they were $10,000, something back then, eight. And I looked at that, and I said, well, we got all these, these slide pots. I never worked with a slide pot. I was all on the, the, you know, pot, yeah. the rotary pots. Yeah. And I said, look it, we got two over here. You got a left channel. You got a right channel. Can't you take the right channel wire <laughs> and put it on that slide pot on the right and take the left channel, put it on that, yeah. and then the, the announcer can take and hold both of them at the same time? Right, right. He said, that's the damnedest thing I ever heard. <laughs> and that's what he did. Yeah. I'm sure not quite that simplistically, but that's how we... And we used that from 1981 until 1987 when we built our new studios. Yeah. So every, great. every time they did anything music-wise or the mic, they had to use two it, pots. It, yeah, it was the two pots time. for the, to, to accomplish stereo. They had another pot, of course, for their voice and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pop for the voice, I guess, would be mono anyway, yeah, so you wouldn't right. really need stereo there. And, yeah. and everything was cut in mono in the production room because right. we didn't have stereo. Um, but the people of the area love the station. I could talk about that. You give me about six hours, and, and we'll yeah. maybe, you know, get a little bit of it covered. Well, back, back then, uh, of course, they used to use a transistor radio, so the, the quality... The, oh, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't that all... bad. No, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I yeah, guess they, they were still using transistors in the uh, yeah. They put that little, the 80s. little one thing in their ear and oh yeah, yeah. jamming down the street. Yep. Yeah. yep. <laughs> but um, we had that station. Uh, we owned it. Uh, 
owner operator, hundred percent of it. It was uh, something that, uh, frankly, I don't think we could ever do, but it worked. And now you it, had a winery it, or something too, didn't you? Oh, that's a whole other story. That's yeah. a whole other story. When okay. we built the new, st- in a nutshell, we built the new studios, and Joe Barella, who is a was a sales manager, or sales rep, or something at Wood, uh, Wood AM and FM. Got to talking with him one afternoon about what we were doing and so forth. And I said, we got this big 6,500-square-foot building that we just bought to put the new st- studios in. Right. I said, I got room that I don't know what to do with it. He said, why don't you open up a winery? What? Joe was very good friends with the people who owned Fen Valley Winery in Fenville. In those days, and I don't know, this is, what, 30 years ago, 25? I don't know if you still do it, can do it today, but... You could get a winery license, and as long as you made five or ten gallons or some such number of wine a year, you could keep this license in effect. And because of an agreement that we signed between Fen Valley and Cozy Broadcasting, our corporation, um, we could sample their wine. <laughs> so we built this beautiful, beautiful. I have a. I don't, did I show you that tape? Oh we, yeah, yeah. Arlene yeah. and I did a welcome to Cozy FM right, and AM right. and so forth, and yeah. we take you out a tour around and show the station. Um, we built this beautiful winery that just for several years it did very, very well. South Haven had experienced a, a real dip in tourism in the oh, it must have been the early '90s. So we scrapped the project, and but it was fun. It yeah. was a, now you would have to start a, a brewery. That's so right. Could, yeah. now, now you could. We build it as uh, the world's only radio station in a winery, or is it the only winery in a radio station? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I've yeah. never heard of it before. That was the first yeah. for me when you told me. So. It was, it was, it was, it was fun. We signed the FM on uh, the first thing to be broadcast. I came on and I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cozy FM." I'm going to start to get a little emotional. Yeah. Uh, here's Paul Harvey. Well, we had Paul Harvey, we had Detroit Tiger Baseball, we yeah. had just a real good, uh, soft adult format. Not quite MOR, but we did that. Ty- we we appealed to a lot of people, right? Uh, but we had a, a format of you know that was well executed, just uh, of of soft rock, um, and we had that station from October first, uh, or let's say August first of nineteen eighty one until. April sometime 1996. So we had a little over 15 years. Yeah. Well, that took some remembering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't thought about that but in a while. That was kind of the last station, wasn't it? Then you That's went into the last the... time that I worked in radio. Yeah. yeah. So. Last time I was on a microphone until I started doing commercials for somebody that has a client <laughs> or two in the Whitehall area. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I had, I don't know, what I have, 30, 35 years in the business and, uh, Loved almost every minute of it. Yeah. Yep. There is one story we did forget to talk about. What's that? Uh, well, I'm sure it's more than that, but the one that uh, you know, cause because you were you were there and you were part of it, was the alley-oop story at TRU. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> everybody heard about it, but nobody, nobody was actually there like you. You were actually there. I was there. I had a small part in it. Um, Skip Knight came up with the idea to play this outrageous record. Nonstop. Uh, Bill Trapp would go on the air when the record hit number one. I'm pretty sure it peaked at one. Yeah. And he'd say, I got to play this record again. I hate this record, but they tell me I got to play it. And hell, you boop, you know, the record would yeah. start. Yeah. And he'd, he'd, he sometimes he'd take the needle off and he'd go to another song and people would call and complain. And that was, he was getting, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, PR from it, bad PR mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, they came up with this promotion, uh, put Bill Trapp in a loincloth on the roof of the TRU studios. Those studios, before they, before they were turned down, were flat. So I helped carry some of the equipment. Now, I'm a, I'm a junior in high school. Okay. This was done during the summer of my junior year, between junior and senior year at Muskegon High School. We had moved from the south to Muskegon in the... Um, just after the, the last semester of my junior year, I think it was. And it's another story how I got out to True, but Franklin Poling was uh, instrumental in that. Ray Hozier was instrumental in it, and Fred Tascone was instrumental. In it. Anyway, I was a kid hanging around the studios, and they said, hey, you want to you wanna help us with this promotion? What do you want me to do? Well, we need to bring a record player <laughs> and a microphone and so forth to the roof. I said, oh, my. What is going to go on? Uh, and then... 
maybe the other thing is Bill probably needs something to drink to keep his whistle wet. <laughs> I said, okay. Deli- so, you, so, so you were delivery boy before you were so, radio guy. So, okay. So <laughs> the whole afternoon and early evening, I had to lug six packs of, I can't remember his favorite beer, but Bill loved his beer. Yeah. But that was my claim to fame with the Alley Oop. And we, sh- we could do a whole half hour segment on that, I think, because it was the most fantastic radio station promotion to this day. Yeah. Nobody in this market has touched it. Well, see, yeah, there you go. You're part of history right there because I, you were you I were guess, part of that whole I thing. I guess so. Yep. Bringing beer up to them. <laughs> <laughs> but do you remember? Do you remember the flavor? What kind of beer it was? And that's or? what I said. I'm trying to think. I, Hams, the beer refreshing. Hams. Yes. Oh, yeah. It maybe yeah. wasn't out of Chicago, but that's where I remember seeing the commercials. I think Bill was the Hams guy with the, the little guy. beavers beating their tails on the yeah, log. Yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 I forgot about I, Hams. I, I, I think it was Hams. I, I was very happy with uh, uh, the people must have learned something working at our stations because so many of them went on to bigger and better things. Uh, John Leader, do you remember that name? No. John Leader was known on R&R, the radio and records program, as Dr. John Leader, real name John Alfinito. Father was a physician in Grand Rapids. He was our midday announcer at WGRD AM in the late 60s. Uh, John ended up at KHJ. John was the voice. John, for a number of years, did the opening voice for Survivor. John's on a bunch of stuff. He, you know, Okay, pe- the Survivor, the, Survivor the television TV show. show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's not doing that anymore, I don't think, but he's a big voiceover talent in the uh, uh, L.A. market and, yeah. of course, all over the country. So that's that's kind of the neat thing about, you know... How come you never that, got into that? I mean, you got a great voice. How come you never got into the... Because it took 24-plus hours a day to run my own station. No, I understand that, but yeah. I mean, after the station, I mean, I understand because, you know, you were running a... Because we went into a whole different... A whole different avenue, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. We built a deer ranch, <laughs> which is another story. <laughs> And that's not Deer Park Funland. We're it's not, not talking Deer that. Park. No, no it no. was a fun place too. But uh, we yeah. were in that for fifteen years. We owned our own station for fifteen, and you get to the point where that's enough. Yeah, that's yeah. enough. Okay. So well, anyway, thank you, Oscar. This has been. I didn't plan on this. No, I didn't either. But, but hey, thanks. I appreciate it because you know. <laughs> Here's your show. Maybe we got, we got a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody else is staying home. You know, I'm one of yeah. those, those stupid ones venturing out. Yeah, I'm one of those stupid ones to let you in the door. But anyway, yeah. That's right. I, I took my temperature before I left. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. All right. Talking good. tunes. All right, boss. You got enough? Just enough? Are we done yet? Huh? Okay. We done yet? I mean, who's listening to this? Okay, boss. That's all she wrote for today. Bye. There you go, Oscar. Guaranteed to attract, um, nobody. There, we done? You want to pass me the alley-oop record? The loincloth, too?